and welcome to Amigos Retro Gaming. In this instalment of the Amiga 2000 series, I uh, give the old girl a much needed hard drive controller upgrade, which includes RAM and some bootable media. Now that media is not a hard drive or a floppy drive, you may be able to guess what that is. And uh, I've put her through a, uh, a fairly basic um, benchmarking uh, routine with Frontier Elite 2 and also give the old keyboard a good clean up. This is quite interesting. The This card here is the 8-up uh, RAM card that showed faulty in a previous video and so what I've done is I've actually um, taken the card that I had, this is the four meg card that I had in there and the two megs on board here and four megs on this eight up card and if you've watched the previous video you would have seen that uh, two here four and four should be ten but it was only showing eight so I removed the eight up card and the memory test passed so I assumed that the 8-up card was faulty. In light of the fact that the maximum for the um, memory space in the Zorro slots is 8 megabytes, um, that would make sense that there's going to be a problem with 10 megabytes in there. And so I thought well I'll remove this card here and put just the 8-up in and interestingly, uh, not just is it passing the test now. So if I run sysinfo, and we have a look at the memory configuration, you would expect 4, which we've uh, got here, and 2 on the accelerator card. But we don't have any memory from the accelerator card showing up here. Now, with this card installed, I get 6 megabytes of RAM, 4 here and 2 on the accelerator. Now, taking this out and installing the 8 up with 4 megs, I get 4 and none here. So, that's interesting because it looks like the 8 up is disabling the uh, 2 megs of RAM on this accelerator. Here we have the Great Valley Products A4000-HC Plus 8 Series 2 hard drive controller with RAM. So it looks like for, I would say, 1 megabyte SIMS, 30, meg, uh, 30 pin SIMS. So let's first of all just plug that in and see whether we get... Good memory test. I've also removed all other RAM, so this is the only RAM plugged into the Zorro 2 slot, and of course, we've got the 2 meg on the accelerator there. It's taking a while to boot. But I think that's quite normal, as you would have seen also in the other videos. That the if there's it appears if there's a hard drive controller card installed. There we go. That's booting now off the floppy. If there's a hard drive controller card installed, but no hard drive installed, it does take uh, around 18 seconds of timed um, for things to start happening. So yeah, it pays to be patient. Um, when waiting for things to happen with these machines and not just assuming that there's you know uh, a fault in turning the machine off before it's uh, that 18 seconds has passed so let's use um, sysinfo here okay what do we got memory 2 meg so yeah that's the accelerator RAM 4 meg that's the hard drive card RAM and the one meg on board. So, yeah, that's 
seems quite happy. Next thing to do is to install a hard drive. Here's a bit of a trap that I found. Is the there's a little key on the connector here that locates into a little cutout on the controller socket here. Now I also noticed that actually underneath this power cable here, I'm not going to pull that out because it's a pain to get out, is the number one. So that would tell you that the pin one is down here. And I just assumed that this cable was ready to go. I plugged, I lined the key up with the slot, plugged it in. But if you have a close look, you'll notice that the stripe for pin one is up here, not down here where it should be. And I was testing drives on here and I was finding that the computer was not booting from, uh, you know, uh, unknown drives. I didn't know what state they were in. I knew a couple of them were bootable, but um, the machine would just show a black screen, wouldn't start up properly. So I thought maybe I'll, you know, try it this way to try and put pin one here, but it, of course it won't fit in because the key is on the wrong side now. It won't fit. And so I had a close look. And you might be able to see it's been glued. So what I think's happened is that this uh, strip, cable strip here, has come off of the connector and when it's been put back on, it's been put back uh, back to front. So where the stripe should be down here, it's no longer. Uh, I noticed the glue on here, which is a dead giveaway that um, something not quite right. So, you know, I tried a couple of drives with um, this cable and I thought, well, let's try another um, cable. And lo and behold, the machine boots. And if you have a look at this, uh, what looks like a perfectly good cable, perfectly brand new, key locator, pin one, matches perfectly along with the uh, key, I think there's a key on the hard drive, I'll just check that. Uh, I can't see one, but I'm assuming that will just plug in. Yeah, it's probably easier to do with the drive actually out. There is a key, a key slot, so That in there. Plug this in the slot here and we will have a booting Amiga. Yep, okay. There's no uh, floppy disks in any drive there. There we go. So yeah, this error message and a CD error. So there we go, a working um, hard drive. So considering that I don't really want to play too much with that drive uh, because it belongs to the 2500 build that I've got, I'm going to uh, try another couple of drives just to see uh, what I've got there. Remember the zip drive from previous video where I actually get that uh, booting on my Amiga 500 over here via the SCSI port here on the A590. I've plugged that into the back of the GVP A4000 card, the hard drive controller and um, lo and behold kind of as expected it's picked it up on ID6 
uh, actually looks like there's an operating system on this disk already. I may have already uh, put something on here, but let's try rebooting and see what happens. The plan is to potentially use the uh, zip drive to store the backups from the hard drives. Yes, it's booting. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, now, it's a matter of working out whether I've got enough room. So I've got about 45 megabytes free here, and I suspect yeah, 47 on the other drive, so on the other partition. Not sure if that's going to be enough to store any backups here. I might try and track down another zip disk maybe and um, format that with a large partition. I've plugged in this big beast of a drive here. Uh, when I say big beast, I mean physically it's a big fat beast of a scuzzy quantum drive and it's all of 40 megabytes, so not so big. Anyway, the software for the GVP, the Great Valley Products hard drive controller, actually detects the drive, so um, this is really good news. We've got a working controller. Uh, that's the second drive I've tested and um, both of those drives are working so we've got a DH0 and a DH1 looks like here uh, again I'm reluctant to blow this drive away and start from scratch because there is uh, more than likely data on there that I, I want to retrieve so if I can do that um, at least get that data off onto some other storage media well then uh, I'm happy to blow it away and start again. So I'm booting here from the um, GVP floppy disk and one reason I want to do that is because this drive that I had in there before, the big fat beast is set to ID6. Someone's labelled it there. I used the software to confirm that. And so what I'm doing here is just confirming what the ID is of this other drive that I've put in. And that looks like it's ID0. So because they're on separate IDs, this one being 0 and the Big fat boy here on ID6. I should be able to plug this in to the SCSI cable and um, have access to both drives, in which case I can back one of them up. Now, this is a 100 megabyte drive. It says megabytes used, 100 megabytes remaining. That'll be formatted space. Uh, two partitions DH0, DH1. So, DH0 is a dead giveaway that it's a bootable the main bootable workbench partition and DH1 will be like a work partition so hopefully there's enough room to um, uh, back up old fat boy here 40 megabyte fat boy I guess the obvious answer would be to try and get two drives running um, so I'll try that next so to get two drives uh, running concurrently on one controller um, I need to replace this cable here. So one end into the controller, one end into the hard drive, so one hard drive. But if we have a cable like so, we've got one end to, to hard drive, one to controller, and the other end to second hard drive. So providing the IDs, the SCSI IDs are set correctly on the uh, hard drives, we should be able to run two drives. So I'll just go ahead and plug those in. I'm not sure of the state of this cable, so 
hopefully this all works. So currently I've got uh, Big Boy here plugged in to the um, controller card on ID6. The cable comes out and runs off to the second hard drive on ID0. And then over here I've got a zip drive, SCSI zip drive plugged into the back of the hard drive controller card on ID5. So by rights, if all's happy, we should see all of those drives. Um, not exactly sure what the plan is at this stage, but I think I will blow away the zip disk here, format it at one single 100 megabyte partition and get at least one of these drives or one of the partitions backed up onto that zip disk there. Now um, I may need to use several zip disks in this process but let's just see how that goes. It's picking up 100 megabyte drive. I suspect that's the actual hard drive you could see hanging out the back. ID 0 Next drive, ID5, that's my zip disk. And then ID6 is of Fatboy Slim. So, yep, it's picking all of those up. I guess if I boot off a workbench floppy disk, then I can manually copy files across to the zip disk from the hard drives. Okay that's booted off the workbench floppy. Now I'm assuming that you can just do a straight out copy of all the files from one disk onto another and that would be a valid backup but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, I'm kind of winging this at this stage. Uh, so we can do a new shell and info will give us mounted drive information. So we've got DF0, that's floppy disk, DH0, DH1, WB underscore 2 dot x that's the uh, zip drive boot partition dh1a so that's automatically renamed that because i think there are two dh1s dh1b so three dh1s and df1 which is uh, floppy disk no disk present so i think that I'll start by formatting the uh, zip disk. I've booted back into the GVP install utility. I've selected disk ID 5, which is the zip disk. And I'm going to do prep and format. Not sure what this is going to do, actually. I've never done this. So. Do you want to copy any disks to this partition? Yes. This will copy files from... Let's just try this. D H 0. Do you want to copy more disks? No. Okay, so that's created two drives here. Can I change layout? Oop. Oop. Ah, 
what's going on there. Try it. So, oh, not sure what's. Uh, I don't know what's happening there. Some keyboard issue. What's going on? Ah, actually, if I do this, one partition, that's what I want, 96 megabytes. Yes. Yes. Okay, got a single DH0. Reboot. To demonstrate uh, backing up, I've uh, attached the old Super Drive, SideQuest Drive here, and the uh, Zip Drive, so they're both SCSI units, and I've just booted off the uh, Workbench Floppy. So the simulation would be um, or the example here would be that the, let's say this is a hard drive I've actually backed all my hard drives up that I've um, plugged in uh, I think there's three drives I've backed up onto this uh, or two zips so um, the if you imagine that this was a hard drive as such one of the hard drives and then backup destination so source destination so to work out exactly what partitions uh, you just type info okay we've got IDH0 which I know is the zip drive we've got a a drawer on the zip drive called SciQuest Backup and the SciQuest I know also is just called Workbench if we do uh, That's the SideQuest you can hear accessing there. If you can hear it over the noise of the drive, it's quite noisy. Um, so the command is copy the source, which is workbench. So it's going to grab the entire workbench uh, drive partition. The wildcard which is similar to star.star .star and dos but I'm not 100% sure if that's necessary if you use the all command now what the all command do, does is it's recursive it will copy all the uh, drawers the sub drawers files within those drawers and sub drawers so absolutely everything and then the destination is um, idh0 which is a zip drive and then the destination folder name and that should be it and here we go we can see the copy happening from here to here now there's possibly better ways of doing it um, I'm not too sure let's say I'm still sort of learning as I go with these I know you can use a an LHA command which is a compression uh, a little bit like zip so you can just do in one command line uh, the source files and then have the LHA command uh, compress all of the source files into one file on the destination uh, so that that might be a more efficient way of doing it, but this is just a quick and dirty way of getting it getting it done. Okay, right, and that's it. Finishing touches here will be. I actually want to put an IDE hard drive into this machine. This super drives, you know, it's it's great. It's removable media and and uh, you know it's pretty retro and pretty cool. Uh, but the disks are only 44 megabytes, so not really big enough to, you know, store a decent WHD load installation. Likewise with the zip, I don't really think it's an option. Um, so I want to get a, maybe a, an IDE hard drive installed. So I've got the 
IDE controller there, the Alpha Data Controller. Uh, so I'll install that physically, um, connect up the CD-ROM drive at this stage at least, and then um, in a future video I'll, I'll work out um, how to install an IDE hard drive. And um, yeah, I'll put the lid on. I think that's about it really. So. Um, Yep, I was going to do some benchmark uh, testing on Frontier Elite 2. Uh, just some, you know, uh, casual benchmark testing really. Okay, just doing a um, unofficial benchmark test on the accelerator in the Amiga 2000. That's the A uh, 2630 and um, this shows that the accelerator is actually working it's definitely a lot smoother than when I tested this with the uh, 68000 enabled so um, yeah I, I just made a comment in the discord channel in our uh, discord that the running at 68000 um, 7 megahertz the game's virtually unplayable. It's about one frame a second. It's totally hopeless. So um, I fired up the machine in the 68030 mode, and this is where it's running it at the moment. So, um, and you know, I also made a comment that the uh, frame rate's probably around four frames a second, and there was just a little bit of discussion as to whether that's actually you know where this machine should be and um, potentially that it was still not quite performing as it should uh, it's definitely better on the 68030 mo 030 mode it's definitely running um, I would say at the uh, 25 megahertz by the look of it but I was really just wondering whether I can sort of eke a little bit more performance out of this card and you know, uh, whether maybe RAM configurations might help. I'm running the machine without any extra memory apart from what's on the accelerator card, so that's two megabytes of 32-bit uh, RAM directly accessible to the onboard CPU on the card. So, you know, just as a, a bit of a benchmark really. Let's have a look at um, what sort of frame rate we get at just this default starting point here. So let's request launch. Launch, okay, so I don't know, four, would it be four frames a second? Anyway, let's uh, point up and accelerate here. Now that doesn't seem too bad. I mean it's quite playable. There's absolutely no problems with playability. And But you will notice that when I turn and face back towards the spaceport the frame rate drops off again. You know which obviously because it's having to draw a lot more three frames a second would it be I don't know I'm not really able to judge it that well but oh, it's close I'd say uh, so yeah I, I don't know oops <laughs> that was a quick game right yeah, I mean that is so much smoother than the 68,000 as you'd expect. Uh, just get a little rear view here just to see what that looks like. Let's accelerate out of here. Let's go for a rear view. There we go. 
Yeah, four frames. I don't know, four frames a second. Yep, there we go. Spaceport behind us. Yeah. So, um, the reason I was doing these tests here is because um, the, there was a comment about a, this game running on an Amiga 1200 with a similar speed accelerator card and it, you know, runs smooth as, smooth as, um, but is it any smoother than this? I'm not sure, it's difficult to say. So I'm just going to run a few sort of comparisons really. I might drag out my A1200 as well and just, uh, it's got an accelerator in it as well. I think reasonably close to this speed. Just to do a little bit of comparison there. So that seems fairly smooth. I mean the little uh, satellite dish there rotating around seems fairly smooth. Yeah. I mean plenty of frames per second there. No worries there. I thought that maybe removing the 4 megabytes of RAM on the card that I had in there might have made a difference. I thought maybe the card running in the Zorro 2 space there might have been dragging things down a little bit, but I mean, does this game really rely that much on the speed of the RAM? I don't know. I, I, I don't know whether it's sort of processor, obviously processor's got a lot to do with it, but how much of... Um, the performance is, you know, gained by having, you know, really fast RAM um, or the correctly configured RAM. So, yeah, I don't think removing the 4 meg of RAMs made any difference at all, actually. Uh, I'll put it back in and I'll have another wee try, but, um, yeah, I don't think it's made that much difference. Now this is a, another keyboard I'm going to use because um, I had a lot of trouble yesterday and in fact this one uh, has a problem where the spacebar is not working. Oh, you have to press it very hard to get it to work. This is actually off a um, Amiga 3000. So I had problems where the it would pause and not type the letters and do other weird things like re repeating random characters flat out. Um, it would seem to be intermittent, come and go. Uh, it was really weird and you type, you type something sometimes and nothing would happen. Uh, it was pretty hard to use at times and it would come right for a couple of minutes and then start to play up again. It was quite weird. And I thought, well, uh, you know, maybe it was something to do with the hard drive controller. So I removed that, the uh, problem remained. And um, the, it's under here. Right. Okay. Oh, yeah, that lifts away quite nicely there. And then so I, uh, you know, suspected the uh, accelerator card. The thing is, the keyboard had been working perfectly for a long time. Uh, so, you know, I sort of started suspecting some of these cards have been installing. Removed the accelerator card, and the problem seemed to go away. Uh, but what I didn't possibly do was test it for long enough. Um, and, you know, with the those other cards removed. So, I thought it was the accelerator card causing it. So I put another accelerator in and I saw the problem happen again, so, um, you know, then I was sort of convinced that it was an accelerator card issue. Anyway, I tried another keyboard, an Omega 2000 keyboard, on that one, this key was uh, repeating the little, um, what would that, the one below tilde there. It was repeating and you know it wasn't well it didn't appear to be stuck I was tapping it and it wouldn't do anything no other key would respond 
so um, that's actually a faulty keyboard that Omega 2001 and then I thought I'll try my keyboard on another computer and it did the same thing I put all the cards back in and used this keyboard here albeit uh, with a faulty uh, spacebar and um, lo and behold problem solved so after all that I <laughs> figured out it was just a faulty keyboard uh, but yeah sometimes you can go down the rabbit hole with these things but anyway um, I'm not quite sure how far to go here I just want to get to the contacts and try and clean up contacts for the spacebar here to see whether I can do anything with it get this back plane off watch me stab myself with the screwdriver that would make an entertaining video I'm sure <laughs> that's really tight going anywhere. It's just threaded into the actual chassis here. Better not forget my coffee. Spectrum. Right, mm, should probably remove this little connector here. Okay, so gets tangled up somehow. Uh, not sure what's going to happen here. Is it all going to fall apart? There's another screw here. Oh, yeah. Another screw in this corner. part here oh, it's still uh, crimped on there not crimped stuck stuck down all right let's see what this reveals mm, not a hell of a lot uh, although does this oh yeah aha uh -huh. oh Sorry about the light. Dusty. I wonder. No, no contact under there. Uh, I'm assuming that's the spacebar contacts. I'll just give those a clean. Actually, I'll clean the whole. Uh, I'll clean all of the contacts there, just with isopropyl alcohol and a cotton bud or Q-tip otherwise known as okay a little bit dusty actually very uh, serviceable, serviceable design I, I really like that design yeah so I guess you 
Oh, I probably should clean these plungers as well. Yeah, there's a little bit of gunk on there. Okay. Yeah, nice and easy to get to. It's great. Alright, uh, I won't bore you with the details of cleaning these. I'll just wipe across these with isopropyl alcohol. Likewise on the uh, pads here on the board and reassemble and test. Bit of black coming off there. And I've also just run over the keys here as well, the bottom of the keys. So I've done all the pads, cleaned all the pads. My other half wondered what the what the noise was. She said it sounded like I was murdering a gerbil. I'd never do that to a gerbil. Right. So I've cleaned all these as well, so now you can see that the uh, cotton buds are a bit black. That's mainly from this board here, the blackness. Not a lot came off this here, off the, that side. Uh, so just have to be careful to align the LED here because it's you could actually slide that for alignment, so I uh, just have to make sure that's nicely aligned goes into a little hole just below the caps lock key there we go that's it assembly is the reverse of disassembly pretty straightforward uh, while I was at it I washed the um, out of casings. I'm not going to bother with retro bright brighting. I'm not really into retro brighting. I'm not convinced. From what I hear, it's a temporary solution, and um, I'm not convinced that you know it doesn't damage the plastics in some way. So yeah, I'm not going to bother. I don't bother. I'm quite happy to leave them yellowed looking like this Omega 500 here is looking a little bit yellowed it doesn't really worry me I don't really want them in absolute pristine condition kind of like that used look so this is a perfect example of uh, what I showed in a, another video where you reverse the screw until it drops into its thread and screw it back up now this is important because it's pla this is screwing into plastic so you don't want to sort of start a, another uh, thread as such. You want to you want the screw to drop into the original thread that's was created originally. So just backing it off there until it drops in is fine. Uh, also, I wouldn't tighten everything up to start with. I'd get all of the screws just started, and then go back later and tighten everything down and the reason for that is because if you tighten you know some of these screws down you might find uh, further down that you might not be able to get screws in because the holes aren't quite lined up and that way if you don't tighten all of the screws at once or to start with uh, there's a little bit of movement you know between the two pieces and um, allows you to line up the screw holes not so much of a problem with this here because it's got locators here so you can you know fairly well that the holes are lined up but it's just a habit really I'm a mechanic by trade so <laughs> Some of these things 
stick with you. Okay, that's all the screws in, just a matter of tightening them. This is weird, it doesn't seem to do anything. Uh, oh, it might screw into the plastic under there, I don't. I don't know, but there's thread in the actual chassis itself, so it's kind of doesn't seem to be really doing anything anyway. strap. That's also quite a handy trick for holding screws so instead of you know putting that there and then trying to get this screw there while you hold your tongue right and this thing wants to move and you know gets a bit awkward. Put the screw into the terminal, screwdriver, bam done easy. Actually I'm, oh, I was going to say I might test it but these capacitors are kind of hanging down, I don't want to stress those. Yeah, so I'm not sure what went wrong with the other keyboard, I guess, you know, some sort of control issue. Hmm. Anyway, get the case for it. There's the um, original colour there and you can see the top cover it's looking a bit yellowed but that's okay yeah I kind of worry about the long-term effects of uh, retro brighting just not a hundred percent sure about that put this back together actually I might just um, sit the keyboard in the tray there and give it a test. Right, keyboard test. So I'm just doing three keys there. So before it would pause and nothing, even though I was typing, nothing would happen or key would stick like that and then it might go okay but this seems fine but this is not the faulty keyboard by the way, I'm just demonstrating what was happening, I definitely couldn't do all that, anyway space, yeah that's what I wanted. So yeah, that's nice now. Time to clean these keys up. You know the key cap pull is quite good for just straight up pulling. It's interesting, the caps lock has actually got a spring uh, that's probably because that's a toggle switch, little spring there, and these longer keys have got a stabiliser under them, some of these are really hard to get off, it's got a stabiliser under it, and it's just a matter of, I get a little screwdriver and just push it, a little hinge out, so that the key can come off. So those little turned in pieces here go into little slots in here. So I just get the screwdriver and just 
pull it out on the on this here and it releases one side and then you can just uh, you know pull the key across and out on the other side space bar has got two springs and this little yellow rubber dome and if you look at the difference in the color it's quite weird between spacebar and a normal key you notice the spacebar is yellowed a lot more than the standard keys it's uh, I guess it must be made of different plastic or have different um, makeup of some sort and the enter key is going to stay there because I just felt that there was just too much pressure to get that off I did pull on it fairly hard I heard it sort of creak a little bit um, sort of worried me that I might break the little post there so as you can see this is quite crusty this keyboard needs a good clean for typing I'm really impressed you know I use a a mechanical keyboard mainly I, I have an, an IBM model M at home and I had a I have a model F at work so fully mechanical switches but for a rubber dome um, this keyboard is actually really quite impressive it's a Mitsumi yeah quite impressed actually I think probably out of all the Amiga keyboards this one so far I, I've found to be the nicest um, the Amiga 2000 keyboard seemed to be a bit uh, mushier and the Amiga 500 keyboard this one it, it's not bad but there's not much sort of tactile feedback there it's quite soft um, yeah anyway time to clean this mess up get the keys cleaned right I've cleaned up the uh, keyboard a little bit more I just used a uh, slightly damp rag just dampened with water only uh, I didn't get too carried away it's you know still a little bit of dusty bits and pieces here and there I cleaned up the enter key so um, yeah it's all set to put back together So there we have the Amiga 2000 getting closer to where I want it to be. Um, plans are to get rid of the uh, ultra cool super removable SideQuest and um, install a IDE hard drive and connect that to the IDE controller there. Just and get WHD load installed, get some games going. So that's probably as far as I'll take this uh, computer. Keep an eye out for the IDE upgrade. And uh, thank you very much for watching.